Hello everybody, my name is Michael Kotutawa Johnson. I'm from the Hopi Indian Reservation, a uh, place where they have the oldest inhabited village in the United States, over 1200 AD, and the agriculture that we do out there is regenerative in nature. Um, we've been doing this for 2,000 years, growing crops in the desert with only six to 10 inches of annual rainfall a year. You need to know what you're doing. <laughs> and so that's what I'm here to talk about. But I'm here to mostly to talk about what I'd call the business of conservation. Um, I call for the restoration of the American Indian food system. First of all, you know, I work for the Native American Agricultural uh, uh, Fund out in um, Arkansas, but I'm able to work remotely at home from Hopi. You know, our principles are healthy lands, healthy people, and healthy economies. Uh, kind of our NAF, our review, we're basically founded upon the Keep Sigal lawsuit. That was an equity lawsuit um, and back in 2018. And out of that, we have business assistance, agricultural education, technical support, and advocacy services. You know, so this restoration of the indigenous food systems includes basically three components. First of all, it's equity, bringing back equity. It's also going to uh, highlight some of our environmentally sound agricultural practices. These practices are over 2,000 years old. I used to work for the NRCS, and unfortunately, um, a lot of our practices aren't quite uh, up to their par. And so I'm trying to help do that. I just got a paper published on, on that, that we have the same conservation outcomes as what Western science has. And so uh, also this will help increase economic opportunities. And so why call for the restoration in Indian country behind the guise of conservation? Why do I want to move that way? First of all, this is a, just a great statistic. Indigenous people protect 80%, 80% of global biodiversity on only a mere 25% of the planet's land with only less than 5% of the population. And that's huge, guys. 80% of global biodiversity is protected by indigenous people in the globe. Where did the rest go? I have no idea, you know? And so, you know, and why, why this is also prime? Because only 2% of Indian country has been developed. The rest, for what I would say, is pretty much in its original state. So this, so what I'm doing is I'm developing a biodiversity map of Indian country to show you what the biodiversity we have on Indian lands. You know, it's going to be regionally based, showing plant species and wildlife diversity. It's going to be a visual representation to demonstrate the soundness of indigenous land management practices, those practices that have been practiced for 2,000 years or more. It's also going to provide an incentive to promote environmentally friendly agriculture and the development on Indian lands. And so what makes indigenous conservation land management schemes resilient? What makes an area like this, which is my home on the little plateau down there, how can I be able to grow corn in that type of region? What makes that happen? And so first of all, uh, this term indigenous agricultural knowledge, a term that I came up with is an applied knowledge for raising food and water and other agricultural products that is grounded in indigenous belief systems and practices which have been time tested for over a millennia. That's why it's important. Also, the continuity or management schemes, you have pictures on the right of 1915 versus 2015. Those are the same field. The pH levels on those field is still 7.1 to 8 point something without any, any pesticides, herbicides, compost, anything like that. You know, so how do you manage a system like that? You, know, you, you go up there and you figure that out and I can tell you how to do that. So also this land management system, our lands management systems are based upon survival. The problem that here we have in the United States, it's based upon economics and to have economics, you need to have quantity, you need to have efficiency, and, and you need to have the market support that. Unfortunately, when you have those things, you also need a lot of inputs, things like PEK, potassium, nitrogen, and phosphorus. And what happens to that? It goes down the stream like you have in the Gulf of Mexico. It's not regenerative and it's not sustainable. So we need to move away from this market-based driven system, in my opinion, into a more of a value-laded system that has a cultural component to it. That means conservation planning needs to have a cultural component to it in order for us to have equity so that we can participate in some of these conservation programs. The next thing, uh, and when I, when I talk about the, the outcomes, I did a study recently uh, just got published in the Journal of Water and Soil Conservation uh, by the Zero, Zero Colony, Journal and Soil and Water Waterization Society Journal. And it's what it's showing is that our practices, uh, not only the Hopis, but there's other tribes in there, we have the same conservation outcomes that anything Western science puts forward. But the only problem with that is, folks, is that those, those, those programs on the left at NRCS are funded because they're scientifically validated. Our 2,000 to 10,000 year old practices aren't funded because they're not validated, scientifically validated. Something's wrong with the picture there. We need to help resolve some of that. 
So, you know, like I said, you know, other thing that I'm trying to do here is, is this conservation, because a lot of our, our NAF grantees, they are carrying on our indigenous conservation legacy. You know, we're working on partnering with people like the Walton Foundation, the Nature Conservatory, to try to support the culture that's existing out there. We don't need to dismantle it. We don't need to improve it because it's already proven, right? It's a matter of just harnessing what we have out there and making that grow. And so what can the business of conservation achieve in Indian country? For one thing, it could ensure the future of our youth. Now, we've talked a lot today, but we really should talk about our youth because that's our future, right? We've heard that time and time again, but they're really our future. This happens to be a picture at the house that I've been building for the last 16 years. Doesn't look like much, but it's home. And uh, those little kids are just up there. They just got finished doing some whitewashing, and I gave them an all in Iricorn because the Iricorn and Hopi Society is the most important gift that we've ever given. It sustained us for over 2,000 years. And to plant corn at a depth of anywhere from 6 to 18 inches without any, with only 6 to 10 inches of annual rainfall a year and to have it come up and be productive is off the charge, folks. I dare anybody who, first of all, I dare anybody that can say they're more than a 250th, 250th generation farmer like I am, but I also employ them to say, look what we can do in the future. So, you know, what I'm trying to do is establish, and what we're trying to do at NAF is what we call this reimagining native food economies document. I would encourage you to read that because that lays out the infrastructure that we need to, to benefit to some of these conservation programs on there. You know, and what I want, we're coming up with is these regional food hubs and sub hubs well, that will not only benefit Indian people, but everybody else. All these things will incorporate, you know, processing centers for cattle, things like that where the, where the farmer doesn't have to go 100 miles to process his cattle and go to his nearest reservation, participate in that and get that done. It's about building the community, we're building the bridges between the non-Indians and the Indians, you know, and trying to get everybody to cooperate because we all have the same goal into some aspect, and that's to, to help preserve what we have that we have what we have left on the earth, right? And so we need to take a look at that. Like I said, 80% of biodiversity, where are you gonna turn to, you know? And how are you gonna extract that information? So, you know, those are some of the sub hubs. You can see how that's spreading out. You can see this is our budgets, 3.4 billion over 10 years. That's not much. You know, I could an aircraft carrier costs more than that. You know, and so it's, it's putting money and spending it wisely, you know, and so partnering with organizations that we that we haven't, but ones that I'd like to partner with is important for the political muscle that Indian people need. You know, a lot of people don't understand that, you know, we have the right to occupancy on Indian lands, but we don't have the right to title. That was done under the uh, Marshall Trilogy of Johnson versus McIntosh, so we're allowed to live there, but we don't have title to that land. That's kind of weird, huh? And so uh, I would compare it almost to some other stuff, but I, I don't want to be political. And so but that's the reality of the situation. And like I said, not only will, will our infrastructure development be there, it will also feed other parts of the country. It's going to be, it's going to go not only to Indians, but non-Indians. You know, we did, a, we did a, a recent market study. One of our, one of the poorest reservations has the agricultural capacity to raise $170 million on just agricultural products do, using their own form of regenerative agriculture. That's crazy, isn't it? But it's beautiful. So American Indian reservations could be the next breadbasket of the United States. But we got to do it in a culturally appropriate fashion. It's got to fit what we want to do and not being told what to do. <laughs> There's a big difference there, right? And so it's about kind of bridging the gap. You know, and so here's coming up some of my stuff right now, kind of a little speech. Uh, uh, there's a, down there is a link to my article. But, you know, I want to share one more quick story. You know, when I was happened to be going through Zuni, uh, uh, I, I, was, I was able to stop by just for a second, and I gave the, the youth program there a, a, um, a bunch of blue corn that they had that they didn't have, and they grew it out. They grew it out. And so when I went over there to talk to them, Look what they gave me. They gave me another blue ear of corn. So it goes a hundred thousandth generation. Because right here is what regenerative is about. It's about increasing the next generation to do something better than what you when you left it. Right? And so that's the beauty of that. And so, you know, these are all generations of people here. Last time I was here, I gave everybody a kernel, but this is a little too small for that. <laughs> so we're out of luck, right? And so but well, I appreciate you letting me come today. And so my next speaker is, 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 is Helga there, and she's going to talk some more. But I appreciate that. Thank you. Ich klan cinco en tu teo tatsin. Ich klan cinco en tu teo pilsin. Ich klan cinco en tu teo yewatsin y panemuani. Tota tsini ni wikar, 
Mateo pinsinte kudli en atzatlan. Y pal nemuani en tomuancha ni ayolomi en tlatikpak, y ayolomi en tlatikpak. Tlatzukamati ayot, tlatzukamati ejecat, tlatzukamati tonanzi en tlali, tlatzukamati tlaloc, chutecutli ejecat. I want to thank you all for the invitation to speak here today and for us as Native people to speak our language is just as important as it is to work the earth and grow our food. Our ceremonial calendars are based on an agricultural calendar and that is what connects us and keeps us true to our mission in life. So I'm here to talk to you about what we are doing in the urban sector to keep these traditions, language, way of life, when many of our native and indigenous people have to move to the urban areas. And how we're doing that here within Tehualan. So our organization is called Agricultura Cooperative Network, and we're the largest cooperative and network of sustainable farmers that are using organic practices to grow food for our community. We started Agricultura Network back in 2008 by taking five farmers through a farm training program that evolved into uh, a cooperative and a network, and now we're 40 farmers strong. And on a weekly basis, collectively together, we put, we put out about 4,000 pounds of New Mexico grown fruits and vegetables through various markets, but equitable markets. And the markets that we have developed are community driven markets. We've changed procurement policy practices. How do you move this? Okay. Which one? Okay. Um, this right here, very quickly, is our theory of change, and it's basically to show what we wanted to do. We wanted to keep our produce local. We wanted to develop uh, generational pool of farmers and we have a lot of farmers that come in to farming after their retirement and they all come with we've always wanted to be farmers in our family our grandparents farmed I went into this field but now I'm done and I want to get back to farming the land so that's part of our theory of change but the biggest part is how do we develop the community-driven markets that are gonna sustain our programs, our farmers, and our food production. This right here, we're two organizations. We have a farming entity, which is the cooperative and network of farmers. And then we have our food access program, La Cosecha. And La Cosecha is really important because it's that partnership with the farmers that gives them a steady market every year. They feed on a weekly basis 320 families. Um, and this is all New Mexico grown. It's all they get to know where the farm is at. Many of our farms are located in the South Valley of Albuquerque. And the majority of our farms are in that area. So it was important for us to have community know the farm, participate with the farmers, and invest in their production. So right now, our, our, um, where we move our food is with public education department at the statewide level, uh, with senior nutrition sites in three different counties, Joining us this year will be the senior nutrition sites in four different counties. And we also, like I said, have La Cosecha itself, which is a community-supported agricultural program. But it 
what makes it different from other commercial CSAs is that the farmers do not have to pay to be members. Um, there is no upfront money from any of the cosecha participants. So this is a community investment. Uh, we do accept SNAP, and by that, it is connected to the New Mexico Double Up Food Bucks program. So it is even at a lower cost in the support of New Mexico grown fruits and vegetables through the Double Up Food Bucks program. All of that has been work that we've had to do in the past 10 years at the policy level um, within the state. We changed procurement practices, aligned them. Now the governor has a task force where all the state agencies have to, re have to invest in local food production. And we're making it very clear the equity piece in that. Um, and we have run into some bumps, that's how we recognized, and we're able to call it out, um, just to make sure that all of the small scale farmers will have a fair share in growth, in investment, within all of this procurement policy, state agency um, funding that's going to New Mexico grown. Another very important piece when we talk about SNAP and Double Up Food Bucks, the SNAP piece itself is a high, high percentage of the farm bill. So it is all connected on how we grow food and how we make that food accessible and equitable for all. Um, I'm leaving out the slide, sorry. This is us in the kitchen and also how we work with young populations in schools to understand what it is to grow food here within our state. Um, really working with the schools, with public education department to put that fresh produce into the meals in the schools. On the <clears throat> production side, we work out of an FDA certified facility in the South Valley Economic Development Center this takes us back to what you were saying. The food hubs in our growth right now are so important. Uh, we gotta keep a clear balance between what we're asking in investment. Can we produce that? Can we market that? Can we move it? Can we transport it? Can it be uh, go through the quality control that it needs to? All these years that we've been in the South Valley, working out of the South Valley Economic Development Center, that's been very important because we're working out of a facility that allows us to meet all permitting necessary to market raw produce. We are GAP certified and um, food safety is of the utmost importance, of course, but without a facility, 40 farmers could not aggregate together and we've already outgrown the space we have in this facility. Um, so we can't really grow anymore until the food hub itself expands and we also obtain land where we're right now um, raising capital for that new food hub. But food hubs are so important and I can just imagine what it is to process meat. Um, those are like even further and far in between. Okay, I got my two minute mark here. So I'm gonna run through these slides really quick. This is one of our farms, Los Jardines Institute um, in the South Valley. And it's probably like uh, half a mile away from our, where we, pros where we um, aggregate together. This is our greenhouses. We have three greenhouses in the South Valley. Uh, the gentleman, you can't really see a clear picture of him. He's the president of our board for agricultura. His name is Fidel Gonzalez. And these are, we have an aquaponics piece. Um, let's run and run through those quickly. This is a part of our farm training program. And I want to acknowledge there's Madi here from uh, Bernalillo County Open Space. And um, I see Maya, I see... Um, Oh, there you are. Okay. If all of you from the Grow the Growers program, could you raise your hand? 
Yay. These are our future farmers, in, and they've been doing, you know, committed to learning. They're out there in the heat at, in July by 5.30 in the morning, and they've really shown that they know what it is to farm, not to garden on a large scale, but what it is to farm. So I want to thank all of you for your commitment to the program, but also for being here. And what I want to say about our partnership with Bernalillo County Open Space. Our farm training program takes place in one of their sites, the Gutierrez Hubble House. We have uh, three acres that we do the farm training program and then we have six acres where they incubate. Once they do the program, they incubate to another site, they name their farm, we continue to uh, support them in business development, in different types of of needs of capacity building where they're at. But what is important, really important to this, is that this is a way, the more trainees go through the program, the more incubators uh, we are incubating that become farms, then this is a way that we can show when there's land up for sale that was agricultural land in Bernalillo County, this is a way to say, this is why we need to save this land, this is why we need to keep uh, supporting this farm uh, training programs um, because these farmers, when they become incubators, become part of our food system. They are the ones that are going to continue to feed us and build. So we have gone through probably, we're in our fifth year. Every year we take six trainees and then the trainees move on to incubation. At the end of the, of the of the incubation piece, if they haven't obtained land on their own, they can continue to apply to Bernalillo County for open space land, and any land connected to open space must have water. So this is another assurance we're giving to this intergenerational practice of sustaining new farmers. This site right here is at Grow the Growers, this was one of our training um, newcomers coming in, going back into production. And we are also right now um, doing our um, value added shelf stable product. And we are developing baby food line, we're developing healthy snacks. Uh, and during COVID, that was one of the biggest pieces when all the markets closed especially our rural communities, needed shelf-stable product. So we've invested and we've we're making garlic powder, onion powder, we're making uh, several herbal mixes, and all of our products uh, come under the umbrella of diabetic friendly and no to low sodium. Why? Because diabetes, high blood pressure, all of those, um, diet-related health factors are, are thriving in our communities. So as we produce this shelf-stable product, we want to keep it as healthy as possible. Um, so I know I went over my time. I'm sorry. Okay. We also do um, nutrition education, and we found out very early how detached people were from growing, from cooking their own meals. So we did, we, on our fifth year, we're partner with our local community clinic, um, First Choice Community Health Clinic, Centro Familiar, and, um, and it's really a way to engage family together through nutrition, but also to make those um, healthy eating, active living lifestyle changes. And here are some of our cooperative farms. This is a seed mural there at the South Valley Economic Development Center. Um, so I will close with that. Um, may your sun always shine brightly. Thank you.
Claso Camati, Elga, and Dr. Michael Johnson. I am so honored and happy to be here with y'all. My name is Lucille Contreras. On my dad's side, I am Lee Pan Apache from the northern state of Mexico, Coahuila specifically. On my mother's side, I am Mexica, uh, specifically Coco from the state of Jalisco. And I was born and raised in San Antonio, Texas, and I left as soon as I could. <laughs> Basically, I left Texas when I was 20, and I was gone for a long time. But I'm, I'm home now. And so I call this uh, slideshow uh, Homecoming. And so it started off with a dream, and it started off with a vision that I had. Uh, not your, like, um, you know, your, like, Hollywood vision, okay? I'm talking about a divine inspiration that I received from the Creator. And so, like Mr. Turner was saying, uh, faith is a big part of what, what I do, and I believe what we, we do. So I've always dreamt of um, having a ranch and working on the land. I grew up in San Antonio, one of the biggest cities in Texas. But my whole life, I always felt like something was wrong, something's missing here. And um, I had to leave to find out. And sometimes we have to leave where we're from to find out more things about our own selves. So um, I spent the last six years in the Pine Ridge Reservation, specifically in Porcupine, South Dakota. And I want to acknowledge and give thanks to my Lakota relatives especially Knife Chief Buffalo Nation Society, who has been the biggest mentor for me in this journey of reclaiming our unity and our relationship with the buffalo. It was at Knife Chief Buffalo Nation Society that I met this guy. He was like so amazing, this buffalo. He had such an amazing personality. And this was a herd at that time was about 75 individuals. And this, he was the main bull, but he stood out. I mean, you could just see his, he's got this like flower in his ear. I happened to come up upon him after he was rolling around and I asked him for a picture and he stood up and posed that. So one thing about the bison, uh, little backtrack on Texas Tribal Buffalo Project. Like I was saying my family on my dad's side were Lee Pan Apache. And Lee Pan Apache are indigenous to Texas and we are still in Texas and we are not federally recognized and we don't live on a reservation. But uh, when I was in South Dakota and reconnecting with my Lakota relatives they taught me so many powerful things about our relatives, the buffalo. And one thing is the survival. As indigenous people, we've survived. We're here, you know, no matter what. We're here and we're, we're going to be here, just like our relatives, the buffalo. They're very different from cows. You know, in the, in the winter, you've got to feed your cows, right? You've got to take them hay and make sure the, the ice is broken off the water and all that. Well. The buffalo, they're, they're independent. So his milk mustache there is from um, moving the snow out of the way to get to the grass. To me, that's like one of the most specific uh, epitomes of indigeneity. It's like move what you need to move to to get to the soil, to get to the roots. So <clears throat> on my journey of reclaiming um, my own indigeneity as a Lee Pan Apache woman, and I wanted to help my people back home reclaim our own relationship with the buffalo. In Texas, we've got a whole different system from all over Indian country in regards to 
our relationship with each other has been extremely disunited. However, with elders and leaders like my sister here, Elga. Elga, I, I met Elga about 30 years ago. And I could say that the seed was planted in me then to continue and to go f do the work that Elga was doing. And I'm still learning so much. And there's so much I want to talk to you about your program as well. And so I wanted to be able to provide this opportunity to my people back home, to be able to be near the bison, to just feel their energy, to feel what it's like when you, when you eat their meat as well. It's different, you will feel different. So I prayed and then a few days before I submitted my USDA beginning farmer and rancher, went to a Chinese restaurant, right? And I, this came out of my, I had two in one. So, okay. <laughs> Um, I decided to go ahead and submit my beginning farmer and rancher loan to the USDA and I had it on my desk for three years. Um, you know, changing it. At one point I was going to submit it in South Dakota. At one point I thought about Minnesota because I work in Minnesota remotely for an awesome and amazing woman. You all might have heard of her. her name's Winona LaDuke. <laughs> and, um, Winona has been also incredibly supportive and uh, the, that entire organization, and so I submit it. Uh, I came back to Texas in February, and this, this past February, and it snowed. So of course, everybody, and it doesn't usually snow like crazy hardcore in San Antonio, Texas. <laughs> um, um, so I had the opportunity to take an intertribal bison training. And so here you see some relatives from Cheyenne Arapaho Nation, and then me and my family. And our mentor there in the middle is Tim Frazier, and uh, he's helping me out with some other bison, bison training and handling. Him and his wife actually have been very instrumental. So when I first started thinking about, well, how am I gonna do bison back home? I don't, I want to do it differently. I started Googling. Uh, let me just go ahead and put in Texas holistic bison. Let's see what happens. Well, Tim Frazier popped up and his wife and they've been nothing but supportive and uh, real friends of uh, Lee Pan Apache. So here's our place in Texas. It's uh, 77 acres. Uh, the Men, the gentleman who owned it before had taken a lot of beautiful time and care. I, I could tell he loved his land and the land that he lived on, right? Which this land happens to be in the traditional homeland of my ancestors, the Lee Pan Apache. So um, after I moved here and one thing that I wanted to do was give back to my elders and my community. So um, something that I learned up north in South Dakota was always, um, <clears throat> when we're dealing with buffalo, um, we don't, you know, I'm not your mainstream rancher. Um, we, we have ceremonies before we do everything. <laughs> So here uh, we're having a ceremony. My son is going to harvest the bison. Uh, he's standing there in the white shirt with his hands behind his back. And the gentleman that's talking to him is uh, a World War II veteran. And on May 10th, we had an event where we invited all the Lee Pan Apaches in Texas to come. And I wanted to share and give back to my family and so we harvested a buffalo, and we were able to provide meat to over 100 individuals um, who came from all over the different states, parts of Texas. And I hired a mobile processor, and so since the meat, it didn't have to be USDA certified, we we're giving it to our family as an offering to give thanks and say thanks to our ancestors for all that they sacrificed to survive to 
the work that I get to do. So immediately, everybody went their uh, ways, and uh, we got the hide. Folks went to work on the hide. Folks, folks went to work on the stomach. We used every single part of our relative. I had asked everybody to bring coolers, and so here you see them all lined up, and everybody is getting a gift of bison meat as well as seeds. And um, we also signed the International Buffalo Treaty, which was started in Saskatchewan by Leroy Little Bear. And we're the furthest south tribe to sign this treaty, and the only one in Texas. So now here's my bison. So this is the bull that um, I have. So after this event, our bull was donated. And one thing I noticed right off the bat is his hide did not look right, his skin. Uh, he, he's bald. He was bald in the back there. And um, so I called around, and folks were like, uh, make sure you deworm and uh, do this and do that. Well, I don't have any shoots, and I don't have a dart gun right now. And I do realize that parasites are a problem, and I do have to be aware of them. So what I do is I walk every single day, two or three times, in our pasture, 77 acres, as much as I can. And sometimes it takes me several hours. And I walk randomly, and I look at the soil, and I look at the plants, and I look at the insects, and I look at all everything around me, and it's just churning in my head and in my heart as I go along. So this guy, you know, okay, well, I got to look at his, find myself taking more and more pictures of poop than ever in my whole life. But uh, <laughs> it's, it's just fascinating to me now, <laughs> you know. So, okay, well, his poop looked good. I mean, it's firm and, and all that. Mushrooms growing out of this one. And so um, so here he is now, and I wish I could zoom in because I would show you how his rump is full now of beautiful fur. And you could see his horns shiny right here. So what I did was I reached out to my network, and one of my good friends, Alex Whiteplume from Pine Ridge Reservation, suggested I give the bison hemp seeds. Well, I don't have hemp seeds, <laughs> but... I found something close, which is cottonseed. And I found a local mill in our own community that makes it there. So it's a family-owned business. So I started giving him a supplement of uh, cottonseeds every night. And, if, and I do want to try hemp seeds, actually. And I think there's a study right now of livestock uh, using hemp seeds for livestock feed. Anyway, I swear... <laughs> It's just a small supplement, you know, in, in each bucket. But his fur came back like, whoa. Beautiful. His horns are shiny. He's happy. They are so content. And I'm so blessed and grateful that I get to spend time with him. Some of the other things we're doing is we're building earth houses out of what some folks might say cob, but just like the term indigenous regenerative agriculture, it's our own traditional way of building houses as adobe or earthen homes. So this is pure hay and mud and some of the buffalo poop mixed in there. And so there's two of my interns there and the children you see in front, uh, their mom brings them. She's homeschooling, and she brings them out. And we do lessons with these kids, or mostly they do lessons with us, too, because we learn a lot from them. They are, everything we do is for the next seven generations, every single thing we do. And so he is uh, just a awesome, awesome buffalo bull. I I love him so much, <laughs> but our grass is so healthy, and, and I, I pray to Creator it stays that way. I do everything I can, and right now I'm sort of in the middle. I, I don't want to go full scale like some other bison ranchers who do it more like industrially and put them through the chute and do all this stuff, but I do know I need to take care of them for parasites, so I'm building a relationship 
with the bison. I'm learning every day. Like I said, I, I work full time. I have a job that I work full time, but I'm blessed to work remotely. So I take my laptop, my hotspot, and I sit out there and uh, yeah, yeah, you do have to be careful. They're wild animals, okay? But I respect them, and I, and I feel they respect me. And so um, when I was driving out of the pasture at the beginning, I showed you some pictures of porcupine, South Dakota. And uh, one of the first times I was out there, I was driving out of the pasture. And I said, oh my God, stop. And this cloud in the sky, I didn't, I haven't done anything to this picture, but I, um, if you all see it, I think. So um, it just, you know, I feel very much guided by my ancestors with the knowledge that I know and I'm gaining each and every single day. And I do my best to take care of the soil, to take care of the grass, and especially to take care of the next center seven generations so that they don't have to go through what I, what I went through and they'll be that much further ahead. And we are rebuilding our relationship with the bison. I'm so excited that just last night I got an email from a, a tribe in Texas that uh, wants to partner with Texas Tribal Buffalo Project. And so um, that's really the work that I wanna do is to reunite our tribes in Texas. And so as a way to support our nonprofit, we, I do sell, I am a purveyor of bison meat, and that's what we do to uh, uh, support our nonprofit. And so I'm just uh, really grateful to be here today. Please check out Texas Tribal Buffalo Project. I'm on all the sites, and um, I hit the ground running, and I'm still running, and I guess we'll Go ahead and open it up and see if anybody has any questions. Claso Kamati. All right, folks. Any questions for any of the three presenters on stage? Yes, sir. Can you, can you tell us uh, what part of Texas your ranch is in? I'm in Welder, Texas. I'm an hour and a half east of San Antonio, off of I-10, if you know Flatonia. Yeah, I'm in Hallettsville, so. I'm, oh my goodness. I, I wanna talk to you afterwards. <gasps> what? Yes, please, thank you. We're neighbors. Yes, yes we have an online question, go for it. This is from our virtual audience. Um, this is for Elga. In the Agricultura Network, what percentage of farmers are black, indigenous, and or people of color? And also, what percentage do BIPOC, um, does BIPOC produce contribute to the overall aggregation? I would say that's about a 75 to 78% mark um, on the, the actual BIPOC farmers. We are a people of color led organization um, and our farmer board for Agricultura is, are the farmers themselves that built the co-op. Um, so we are BIPOC led and it is the BIPOC farmer that is holding about 75, 78% of our collective production. We also had a request from our amazing AV crew. If you can stand, if you're able to stand when you ask your question, we would love that. <laughs> no, you're fine. Any other questions? Yes, I see you. Let me cut across for you. And you're already standing, good job. Um, hi everyone. Hey Helga, it's good to see you again. <laughs> I feel like I always see you um, and I'm glad that we can share space with one another. Um, this question's for Lucille. Um, you had mentioned that you know, you're working with youth and you're learning from them. Um, and I'm just curious, what are some of the things that you've um, learned with and from the youth? Have fun, relax, enjoy life, laugh, play while you work. 
really. I mean, uh, one of the questions earlier on another panel was like, how do you, I'm a workaholic, how do I stop? I, I'm a workaholic, I guess. I mean, I, I roll out of bed, I continue working, I go to bed, I keep my laptop, you know, but um, enjoy life. You know, the kids have such a beautiful, playful energy. And one thing, uh, I'll tell you a quick little story. One of the young men that was in the, the little boy that was in one of those pictures, like super hyper, like bouncing, like really hyper, hyper. And his mom was like, sit down and calm down. And, da, da, da. and I was like, no, just let him. You know, we're, we're out in the country. L run around, run around. And let's go fishing. Do you want to go fishing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you ever been fishing? No. All right, I'm going to show you. Gave him the fishing rod, put the thing on man that little man cast it all the way out into the middle so anyway long long answer to your question but they really teach me how to enjoy life and use the energy that i have to enjoy life thank you we got a question right here i'm wondering um for any of you to answer but uh specifically lucille uh in in the work that you do and the passion that drives you, how much of the work that you do is strictly for your people? And how much, you know, which is sacred to you and how much do you wanna share? So clearly you wanna share to some degree because you're here. But you know, as, and I don't wanna make the, the issue about race, but clearly I look, I look white, but I am Potawatomi, part of the Northern Ute, or used to be part of the Northern Ute as I understand and feel a direct connection to you in some degree. Um, but I also understand that your story is sacred, that your history is sacred, and that that's not for everyone all the time. So how do you distinguish between what is sacredly yours and for your peoples and what you share with us, the rest of the world? Well, we're all related. We're all relatives. So I can't distinguish it. It's, it's always, always part of who I am, what I do, and how I am, and all the work I do, because I do, I do feel that way, you know. Mitake oas, and we're all related. We're all living here, breathing here. We're all relatives, specifically to, to my Lipan Apache people back home. We're a huge group. And um, we're, we're several different bands, and we're relearning how to work together. And so that work is sacred in itself and beautiful and hard. But um, yeah, I guess, I don't know. I, I just can't separate it. Here you go. Hi. So in the presentations, um, I've noticed a number of things that are consistent and, you know, some of the presentations spoke to theory of change, economic development, um, um, incubation, and these are business models that are, are well used. And I just want to know how important those aspects of bringing your whole success in traditional ways of doing things, but combining these business models in creating the success stories? Well, I think that comes to the main uh, message when we use the word sustainable and regenerative. To me, those are already been co-opted. As it was said, we've uh, our ancestral knowledge in growing food, in working with the bison, it's always been sustainable and regenerative. So the economic base that we are working, it's not your typical economic development framework because we're going deep into just transition, um, going deep into um, addressing historical bias, um, and changing the narrative that governmental entities hold and have put on us, such as USDA. 
they um, just they address us as um, what is that word they use all the time disadvantaged that we're disadvantaged farmers disadvantaged ranchers why are we disadvantaged if if our root and our generational uh, existence has always been sustainable and regenerative because of land theft because water was made into a commodity and bought and sold and again driven and damned um, Navajo Nation Hopi Nation uh, people live up in those mesas without water and have for generations to this day when millions of gallons of water flow to California from those reservoirs. And aside from fracking and uranium mining and milling and all of that pollution that gets left for our communities to survive. So I think in this looking at new ways, we're not looking at new ways in our way of looking. Um, we are actually retapping those ancestral ways of growing, of living, of being, of being human, taking care of each other. Um, so that is to me that fine difference in it. Um, and it comes from now having to make those shifts into really like understanding what historical bias is for people of color and native and indigenous people. Um, and it's coming out surfacing where we can talk. It's still an uncomfortable uh, uh, conversation to have, but at least now we can attempt to have those conversations for what? For understanding, for mutual respect, and how it is that we take those teachings to move forward in life. So I hope I answered it. All right, we got one last question back here, and then we'll let you all uh, do your closing remarks. Here you go. Um, thank you all for your talks. You're, you're already speaking to the question I wanted to ask, and, and the big question is, you know, what does it mean to be in good relation? And in regenerative ag, it seems that Anglo views and perspectives and people are often centered and engaging in practices that we might call indigenous agricultural practices. And so how, how do, what does it mean, I think, like to build bridges between what is being called regenerative ag right now and indigenous ag and, and what, what, a, what do good relations look like? Well, good relations to me is making sure that you get along with your mother-in-law. And, and, and what I'm saying that is, is you know, we, we're a matrilineal society at Hopi. You know, the women control just about everything. They own the fields, they provide the seeds, they get the harvest, they distribute the seeds. I classify myself as like a Hopi Shrek. I just move things around, you know. And so it's not about gender, but it's about, it's about, um, balancing your society out you know and I think that's what we need here so a re so a good relations in my opinion would be trying to figure out how to balance your society out you know and that's very hard that's time consuming you know a lot of things that we do at Hopi are built upon consensus you know and uh, but that's important you know so when we say can we all get along that's what exactly what it means you sit there for six hours you have a consensus agreement and then you run with it that's about building good relations, you know? And so it's also what the ladies were talking about here. It's about respecting, it's about resilience. It's about putting the culture back in agriculture. You know, it, it's, it's those type of things that we all need to do. And uh, there's no better example of that than, than watching how a kid at two years old falls down, jumps back up, and he's ready to go again, right? Because that's resiliency from a human perspective. And so sometimes I wish I was two years old but I can't, I'm growing up. <laughs> and so that's how I would, would have a, what I would call a, uh, what, sh what you were saying was a, um, having things become back in balance. And so thank you so much for asking that question.
Is there any final remarks you guys uh, would like to offer us in closing? Any final words? I just wanted to say that I also am a EBT SNAP vendor, and so the meat that I sell, um, uh, you know, that's a big part of the community that I want to get bison meat into the bellies of folks. And so recently I was at an Indigenous Peoples Day march in San Antonio, and pretty much wherever I go, I try to take a cooler with dry ice. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like I've got steaks and roast <laughs> but um, anyway I did take a cooler with me to this march and at the end of the march it was really beautiful because a gentleman came up he's like are you from Lincoln Heights I thought I saw you in Lincoln Heights I'm like no sir I don't live in San Antonio he's like well where's the bison meat I said I got it right here and so he pulled out his EBT card and bought nearly three hundred dollars worth of bison meat and I was just like so grateful to him because uh, you know and happy for him and his community he's like I'm gonna share this with my family my sister and anyway so yes um, I'm just really grateful to be here and thank y'all and um, well for many of you uh, we are here from I am here from New Mexico and I am the chair of the New Mexico Food and Agricultural Policy Council. Um, and we're open to having those hard conversations. We are working on really building bridges, uh, bringing various stakeholders together. And we have learned also that in order to do our long-term vision in all the work we are doing, is for New Mexico, the state of New Mexico, to become a sustainable food state where we're growing our own food, have the hub production facilities we need throughout the state in order to move our farmers' food and feed our own communities. The reason I'm saying that, because in these 15 years, when COVID hit, we knew we, what we invested in building the farm to market and distribution system we have was so important. If we didn't have that set up and rolling in practice when COVID hit us, many farms would have gone under. Um, we were able to expand into the eastern part of the state because we had that quality control, safety in the food, working with collective of farmers and people knew exactly where they could go and make those connections to get food throughout the state. Anytime anything happens in the Central Valley of California, it is felt here in New Mexico. Whether it's E. coli, whether it's earthquake, road uh, damage, trucks can't get through. Our school children, our hospitals, our senior centers and our various markets continue to get the best product because we have that system of uh, farmer to market to consist of that value chain system set up but specifically because of the investment of community driven markets and again because we have that food infrastructure that is so important in that value chain so I want to thank all of you please look us up we're Agricultura Cooperative Network and our food access program, La Cosecha. Thank you. I would, I would just like to say, you know, the Native American Agricultural Coalition, I would encourage everybody to, to read the, the Reimagining Food Economies document. So much was said here today that could help Indian country out. That's very important. Um, you know, and for the most part, you know, I just wish everybody have a safe trip home. I'm going back to Hopi tomorrow. And so I'll be make sure that I'll put some uh, cornmeal down for each and every one of you to make sure that you get through the, year, the rest of your life. <laughs> and so I, I appreciate everything. Thanks a lot.